Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faith, and kindle within us the fire of your own love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be prayed. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did strike the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Holy and Brother of Bank. Pray, pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray, pray for us. Father Carrie. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, Father. So we welcome you to our many retreat again. We've been doing this for about the past five months. And we've had a retreat for two days and three days. And we would have had it three days, but I had a, we had a talk last night in, in Glendale. So we had two places at the same time. We don't have a gift of by location yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We had this session and probably be able to have it one day. <laughs> so, um, these many retreats are really good because it's short, it's not overly demanding. And we've, um, this is what we've done up to this point. We've had a mini retreat on the letter of St. James. So it's five chapters of St. James. And then we've had another one on the, on the letter of, rather, the book of Jonah. Another one on the Sermon on the Mount, those three chapters, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Then we had another one on the four last things, remember? Which was the reality of death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Then a couple weeks ago, you were with us, what, what did we have the last two weeks ago, remember? It's not Thanksgiving, right? So we spent uh, two days in preparation for Thanksgiving going through various reflections on that topic. So uh, today we'll be talking about Advent, and we've got a, we've got a worksheet that we're going to pass up. But I'd like to just start off with a, uh, a personal anecdote, then we'll be able to pass up the worksheets. Um, Okay, this is, this is a thought that occurred to me in, um, before giving my homily on Sunday. I had two masses in Spanish, so uh, it was this. 13 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, my father was still living. My father died seven years ago. So 13 years ago, my father wanted to do something very special for my mother. What he wanted to do, he wanted, he wanted to have a surprise birthday for her 80th, okay? So that was, uh, now if, you, if you're an only child, it's a piece of cake. You get 90 kids and 30, now there's only 30, now there are 39 grandchildren, now back then it was 38, you know? And it's not that easy. But my, my father was able to pull it. He was able to talk with my siblings. And um, so it was, it was cool. So my, my, mom, at my, home, my mom has two homes, one in New Hampshire, another one in Florida. Uh, often those who live on the East Coast, they'll usually fly down to Florida when really get cold and it gets hot, they'll come back to the West, to the East Coast. So she has a she has a place in Vero Beach. Mm -hmm. And you know anything about Florida, it's central Florida. It's 100 miles from Orlando. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, some of the family lives on the west coast, others live in Florida, and the other live on the east coast. So they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. But he was having a lane. They're having a nice country club there in Vero Beach. Probably get a good golf course, so we can be able to play on that. 
uh, good caterers. But also, what my mom loves most is what you people love most. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, not hot dogs or pollo loco, but what you love most is the mass, right? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what my, look, my mom looks forward to most is going to mass every day and then after work making her holy up. She'll be 93 in about a month, okay? So Patrick, you're young, okay? Patrick is getting up there with my mom. He's your senior. <laughs> So the beauty was this, my, mom, my, my dad was coaxing mom to go to the church and um, my mom wasn't really sure well, why we're going to church now because it wasn't a set mass and she said let's just go to church and visit and so she gets to the car and into the church and saw me dressed in the chasuble and she almost had a heart attack <laughs> and it was a heart attack of joy. She would have never thought in a million years that I'd be able to leave California, fly to Vera Beach, and be right there for her 80th birthday. And I, I talked with her just two days ago, and she said it was one of the happiest days of her life, where she had the siblings there, and the grandchildren, I think maybe, maybe a great maybe one of the grandchildren, great grandchildren too, because you know you. You got grand, grandchildren, then the great grandchildren come eventually, right? So, um, what, why am I telling you that? Is because that took a lot of effort to, to pull that together. A lot of effort and, uh, you know, pretty penny, too. Young, right? A lot of money, a lot of effort. Now, if the Broome family made exerted effort, to celebrate my mom's 80th birthday, what are we going to do for the celebration of Jesus' birthday? Amen. You got my analogy? Yeah. I kind of like that thought. I mean, that thought just occurred to me. That's the way I'm going to preach my homily. Because we all know what a surprise birthday party mm -hmm. is. We've all organized that problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we should do all we possibly can all we possibly can to prepare for a birthday that's more important than that of, of John Broome. That's the birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The second thing I'd like to say, another personal anecdote is um, if we want if we really want to live, if we really want to experience the joy of Christmas, then we have to we have to make sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Now I tell you, I, I tell you uh, the sacrifice that that my mother invited us to do was this. This would be about 1962, 1963, I lived in New York. I lived in Rockland County, a place called West Nyack, okay? And my mom said, for Chris, for Advent, why don't we get up and go to Mass? This is right, right about when the Mass was still in Latin, it's being changed from Latin into English. And the Mass was going to be before school. So that means we had to get up at like 5.30 or 6 o'clock. Now you people who are, you people are Californians here, okay? <laughs> so if you, if you go outside, and it's 59... I'm freezing, no? <laughs> For a New Yorker, that's a piece of cake. Yes, and I remember she invited us, and me and my brother, we didn't want to get out of bed because there, at this time, you can get, you can get snow, you can get snowstorms, and um, I, I remember in the car, we were freezing for five minutes, and then the heater, heater, heater was turned on, remember that? The heater turned on, man, did that heater. Boy, did that feel good. But if, if mom did not in, invite us and give good example, I probably wouldn't be here today because I saw the real example that she made, the sacrifice that she made. Oh, 
been in it for nine kids, they're already five of us, and almost back to back to back. But a real sacrifice. And you know what happened after the first week? Me and my older brother, we almost looked forward to it because we were already accustomed to making that sacrifice. For the first three or four days, wow, wow. It was almost like, it was a, it was a real penance. <clears throat> Especially because of the cold. Even though we New Yorkers, we know what the cold is, it's still, it's still a toughie, right? So, uh, these two stories set the, set the mood for what we, what we should be doing to prepare for, for Christmas. One is, is to, um, as we prepare for birthdays, we want to prepare for the life of Christ, the brother. But also, we should be willing to make some type of sacrifice. Some type of sacrifice. Okay, so this, uh, this, this talk is going to be a little bit different than the others. It's going to basically be more catechetical. I'd like to kind of set, this, set the scene for um, Advent. And I was thinking over the past 24 hours, what would be the... I want to give you a biblical passage. I'm not going to give you a hand up. I'm just going to give you a biblical passage that I'd like you to meditate on tonight. Mm. And I believe by far this is the best biblical passage for the whole season of Lent. We're getting to know the Bible a little bit better. Okay, let's ask a biblical question. Do any of you know the longest chapter in the New Testament? Don't all speak at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Most people will say John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse, but there's another chapter that's 10 verses longer. You know, Most people don't know it. It's, uh, it's Luke chapter 1. So Luke chapter 1 is the longest chapter in the New Testament. The Old Testament, you got Psalms and Daniel to go beyond 100 verses. That's 81 verses. So that's going to be your meditation for, for, for uh, tonight. Luke chapter, one. Luke chapter 1. So what do you have in Luke chapter 1? You've got the Annunciation to Zacharias, right? Then you've got the Annunciation to Mary. Then you've got the Visitation. Then you've got the Magnificat. Those are, those are all biblical passages that you're going to be seeing, especially if we celebrate a lady called Lupe and the Magnificat Conception. So I, I couldn't think of a better biblical passage than that to set, to set the tone. Okay, so can you remember that? Yes, Father. Yeah. So Luke chapter, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And uh, this, that'll be it. So we can pass out the we can pass out the worksheets, and this is going to be uh, it's going to be catechetical. I think very helpful to, to set the tone of this of this new season. And by the way, we're all, we're already entering into the new year. Did you know that? Yes, Father. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, we actually enter into the new year January first, which is a Civic New Year, but then the season of Advent, we enter into the new church year. So it's a beautiful time to um, reset our interior spiritual clock and try to arrive at a deeper conversion. So I was able to put together a, a relatively simple catechesis. On Advent, and I'd like to read through it, and then we're going to be doing a few fill-ins to set the stage. So, ready? You all have your worksheet? Almost. Uh, it will be Advent, come, Lord Jesus, come. Well, they're passing it out 
I would strongly recommend that all of you have an advent wreath if you don't have it already to try to have one within the next day or two. As well as uh, if you have a Christmas scene that you're already composing in your homes. Okay? In Italian it's called Presepia. Spanish is called Presepia. In English word, we use the French word, it's called fresh. The main procedure. The language we use. Italian is called Presepia. Spanish is Presepia. The nativity scene or the crash taken from French. All right, so <coughs> here we go. So I'm going to go through the, the, the essential theme, and then we'll, we'll do some fill ins, and then we'll be able to break up into our, into our groups. But there's a common understanding in life that usually your resounding success depends in large part upon the preparation that precedes the success of the project or enterprise. <coughs> Any athletes here? I am. <laughs> no pain, no gain. I know what that baby is, no? When it cross country the first time bring up orders that morning after, right? No pain, no gain. Same thing in our spiritual life, no pain, no gain. We got to work at it. You want to become a saint, you got to work at it. So, this is a time for spiritual exercises, to be strengthening our spiritual exercises. We don't want to be flabby spiritually. No? Gordita, you say in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the success of the party, in large part, depends upon the prior preparation and all its details. Now, that's the story you just told me, right? Yes, Father. Surprise birthday, my mom, the idiot. Mm -hmm. So, a good doctor, lawyer, <coughs> architect, mother, father, priest, and other professionals usually have a serious, intense, and hard preparation prior to arriving at the profession or vocation. But after high school, I ended up by studying another 11 years. There's a long haul, isn't it? Your brother that's a doctor, nine years. No, I'm not, I'm not complaining, I'm just explaining. You've got a PhD. Well, really, with all those years, I mean, I'm thankful, but it was a long haul. But worth it. But worth it. So, if we make a real concerted effort to be good professionals or doctors, we should be even more so to be faithful followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. So professionals usually have a serious, intense, and hard preparation prior to arriving at their profession or vocation. In other words, we do not depend on chance or good luck, which we do not believe anyway. Rather, we depend upon hard work on our part, and of course, the grace of God and His abundant blessings. If you want to get me angry, say to me, good luck, Father. <laughs> <laughs> or, blame the swear to you, Father. I will, I will gently rebuke you, because I don't believe in love. I don't believe in love. I believe in divine providence. Nothing happens with it without God knowing and willing. How many of you got up and counted the hairs on your head? Do you know how many hairs are on your head? God does. Also, he knows when one, one of your hairs falls to the ground, he knows where and when and how it fell. So probably one of your hairs came off today because of the wind, and there it is under, under a, a, um, a tire that's heading towards San Diego now. <laughs> right? And God knows it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that happens by chance. Nothing. So we should never believe in superstition things happening because you've got a rabbit's foot in your pocket 
We've got a horseshoe underneath, um, you know, over your door. We've got a three luck, a four luck, four leaf of luck, lucky charm in your well, you know? And that's, uh, that's wrong. That's superstition. We believe in divine providence. Amen? Amen. Amen. This can be applied perfectly to our relationship to God. We want to arrive at a deep relationship with God, and we must give time, work, effort, and even suffering to truly love God. Jesus wants to be our best friend for now and for all eternity. This being said, a true friendship is a two way street, it must be mutual. Both must desire to establish and cultivate this friendship. The birthdays are important. All of us consider birthdays of great importance. Nobody remembers our birthday, forgets to buy a gift, or send a card, or sing a birthday song. We experience intense sadness. Right? Yes, Father. For that reason, we buy birthday gifts, buy the best cake, and try to sing to the best of our ability the happy birthday melody. Huh? At least we try, right? Yes, Father. By the way, there's only one person that you can forget his birthday, and that's me. Because I only have a birthday every four years. Okay? Yes. <laughs> But it's coming this year. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be the big 17. <laughs> I was born on leap year. How about you? Probably never met a leap year, baby. Here's one right here, no? <laughs> so Jesus' is birthday, the most important of all birthdays, of all the birthdays celebrated in the world, by far the most important and celebrated is the birthday of Jesus. We call this Christmas. Look at the word Christmas. A little class on English grammar. That's not a simple word, but a compound word. Remember you learned that? Compound word. I mean, there's actually two words in one, right? Yes. But is it Christ Mass? Yes. Isn't it interesting? Christ Mass. So in a certain sense, every day should be Christmas because you go to Mass, right? Yes, ma'am. You go to Mass, then you go to the other Mass. So in a certain sense, we're celebrating Christmas every day, Christ Mass. All right. Advent. The time of preparation for Jesus and Brother Christ, we, we call Advent. Mm -hmm. So let us do all we possibly can to understand Advent, to live on Advent fully, so that when Christmas arrives, Jesus will rejoice because not only is it his birthday, but Jesus wants to be born in the very depths of our minds, our hearts, our souls, and transform us. Amen? Amen. A few questions. Come, Lord Jesus. Ready? Yes, yes Father. Our brief catechesis on heaven. Okay, you are experts in Latin. Latin <laughs> veniere, Spanish veneer, and Italian veniere means coming. So, it means uh, we're preparing for the coming of someone very special. And that person is Jesus Christ. Okay, now, the next question I find fascinating. Let's make a parallel. How, how long is Lent? 40 days. How long is it? 40, 40 days. days. Okay, sure. If you, if you really count it, it's going to be a little bit longer because we don't count Sundays. Yes. And then the tree won't. So it's really close to 50 days before Ash yes. Wednesday and uh, Easter Sunday. But the 40 days would be not counting the Sunday. Does it change in the number of days and uh, the length? No. Yes. No. Can't hear you. No. 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 It, it's always going to be 40 days. But it might start earlier. For example, Easter this year is in March. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
and very rich and we're starting really early. However, Advent, Advent that sometimes it's not always the same number of days. So this Advent is about the shortest Advent you possibly can have. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very short. This Advent is basically three weeks because when, okay, what day is today? The fifth, right? The sixth. The sixth. I'm sorry, six. I'm not good at math. <laughs> But, okay, if you look at it, Sunday was the beginning of Advent, right? Yeah, that's right. So three weeks is Christmas Eve. Yes, Father. So practically, it's, it's just three weeks. Okay, Monday, three weeks, and Monday. So it's the shortest Advent. So if Christmas falls on Monday, it's going to be a very short. So I'm saying this because, let's recognize that we, we can't be dragging our feet. So if you really want to live out the Advent, you, you don't have a long Advent. It's a very short Advent. So already three, three weeks from today, we're already into the Christmas season. So as we're preparing for, for, for Christmas, already is a good time starting today and tomorrow in this retreat. What am I going to do to offer the child Jesus? Okay, already... Today, uh, tomorrow, and the following day, what is something, what do you think the child Jesus is asking you to give him? You pray over that. Okay? You have to pray over that. And I would suggest, try to try to choose two or three things. Rather, uh, or even one thing. Better to choose two things that you're going to do than you're going to choose seven things and you're not going to do them well. But choose a couple of things that you really believe is going to be pleasing to God. Okay? For my mom, she believed getting us up early and taking us to Mass was the greatest gift. And I agree with my mom. I thought was it probably wouldn't be a priest now. He's already inculcating in me a future priest the importance of making sacrifices. And the sacrifice was to get up when it's 20 degrees at 6 o'clock in the morning and be shivering on our way to church. So... Uh, ask God in prayer today and tomorrow what is the best gift that you can give him? Amen? Amen. 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 Another story. 1980. Remember where you were? 1980, I was in Rome starting my studies to become a priest. Who was there? John Paul II. John Paul II. And he was just beginning his pontificate. His pontificate began in October 78. So he was only pope for about a year and a half. And he was, some of you have possibly been in Rome. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was in one of the Roman parishes around this time with thousands of little children. Thousands. And he asked the little children, what what gift do you want to offer the child Jesus? What gift are you going to offer the child Jesus? And they said, Pregiamo. Pregiamo. How's your time? They said, we're going to pray. Pregiamo. And John Paul II said, that's really good. But I think that there's another gift that you can give to the child Jesus and the little kids. And he said to these thousands of children, I think you should go to confession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> little children. What a great pope. And then he asked the children, are you willing to go to confession? And they said, si, Santo Padre. Yes. Yes, we will. And then he said, you should go. Blame your souls that the baby Jesus will be born in your hearts. Then the Pope said, very quietly, he said, also the Pope is going to go to confession. <laughs> Love that story. Even the Pope is going to be going to confession. <clears throat> Probably some of you didn't even think that the Pope's going to go to confession. He doesn't have any 
you said to do that. <laughs> you know, the Pope Francis could come to me and I could give him absolution. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. And would, it would be that. I would be Christ for him. And when I say I'm solving for sins, Christ. What a blessing it is to go to confession, right? Yes, Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. So many of you have that habit of going to confession. But maybe this one will make, maybe make the best one in your life. You know, we can always improve, right? right. Yes. yes. Uh, only God is perfect. Uh, we can always make improvements in everything we do. All right. So, um, I thought I would just specify that. The Lent is always going to be the 40 days. But that then it can be five or six days shorter or longer depends on when we start. So we, we don't have a lot of time, do we? Yeah? Life is short. As the Pope says, time is of the essence, right? Okay, can we move on? Barbara uh, says, life is short, eat dessert first. <laughs> Come and buy it on a Sunday. <laughs> Good. So, what, okay, what liturgical color in Advent? Okay. I, I wonder if all of you, off the top of your head, could you mention, mention all the liturgical colors? You can try. White, green, green, red, red, red. Okay, good. Now, I, I wonder if you know why. And you see it's coming out with different colors. I, I, I would be curious why are these different colors? Okay, Pur purple we're going to have, except one Sunday we can have pink. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's optional, we can have rose or pink. Yeah. Rose. Okay, but what about, uh, what about green? Ordinary. Ordinary. Ordinary time. Be good. A little liturgical refreshment course. <laughs> when, okay, how long, how long, how long is, is ordinary time? Long time. It's usually close to six months. It's from the end of the Easter season, Pentecost, yes. uh -huh. all the way up to Christ the King. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And Christ the King is still an ordinary time after that. We got the last week of ordinary time. So the priest comes out in green. This is about 32 weeks. About 32 weeks. Yeah. I'd like to quote for you. Uh, I think I'm going to really impress you. Uh, my, 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 my first poem, can I quote it for you? Yes. It's related to that. Are you ready, Patrick? Green is the grass on the ground. Green is the money I found. <laughs> that was my, before my conversion, okay? <laughs> like that? That's my claim to fame. I've been converted since. So you got... White, Easter season, Christmas season, Mary feast day, saints. How about, how about bread? Right? Oh, Mar 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 okay, Marvis. Mar Mar yeah. And only one day on Sunday is it red, and that would be? Pentecost. Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday. So Pentecost would be the only day that you see the priest coming out red on Sunday. And the red is because the red is because of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Some young people there into the wokeism will probably think red is because of communism. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> red is the is the is the blood of martyrs. Amen. Amen. Some of you got you got weeks. We got two or three back to back Saint Cecilia. We got Pro. We got Saint back to back martyrs. Saint the Vietnamese martyrs, Andrew, yeah, Sir Locke, and Paul, you know, you said Vietnamese, but you got these martyrs coming back to back in November. St. Andrew, yes, November yes. 30th, right? Just recently. All right. Here's a really tricky question. Can we wear black? Yes. 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 Have you ever seen a priest wear black? Not this black type, but the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Father Where? Jerry wears black. <laughs> Is that because he, he's living in past ages? <laughs> no, you can sell a black on, on when you're celebrating a funeral mass. Mm -hmm. And 
or purple or white, but also on all, all souls that mm -hmm. come out in black. It's optional. Mm. Got that? Okay, let's move on. Who are we, who are we preparing to receive? Christ, Christ. Okay, the birth of Jesus Christ. If you have children and grandchildren, you might make a copy of this. You'd be surprised what the children are going to say. Some might say Santa Claus. <laughs> They're going to public school. They didn't say it. Or Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Or Frosty the Snowman. You'd be surprised. Lots of children go to public school. They're not, they don't talk about Jesus. And, and the reason, for, the reason for the season is the person that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's move on. Why is okay? Why is Mary important? Why is Mary important in Advent? She's always important, but there's a special prominence in, in Advent, and I'll, I'll give you the reason. Are you a mother? Are you a mother? Are you a mother? Most of you women are your mothers. Because God chose Mary to be the mother of God. That's the primary reason. And of all Mary, of, of all Mary privileges, of all Mary privileges, Mary as mother of God is the greatest privilege. I was reading a book on Mary, The Secret of the Rosary by St. Louis de Montfort. And he says, every time you pray the Hail Mary, and you say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, Mary leaps with joy. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Every time you say, Holy Mary, Mother, Mary's heart leaps with joy. So if you pray the Rosary, Mary's heart is leaping with joy 50 times. Last night, I, I went with a, a team of people to Glendale to give a, to give a, an Advent um, mission. Yeah. I watched you. You know, you know what we did when we were driving in the car? I prayed Eric Files was my Uber driver. <laughs> Uber. We prayed the Joyful Mysteries, and we prayed the Luminous Mysteries, <laughs> and we pray the sorrowful mysteries. Then we pray the glorious mysteries. Then we pray vespers. Then we pray night prayer. Then we pray the angel list, and then we arrive. Huh? That was a long. So our, that was a, a portable chapel. No? <laughs> Careful! If you're driving across country with Father Groom, you know what you're in for. <laughs> you know what you're in for. No? And often people say, Father, when we drive, man, do we pull out our rosary. <laughs> I know his father Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you do you know, okay, Marian feast day December 8th? What do you celebrate? Right. Our Lady of Guadalupe is a patron of Mexico and the Americas, and she is the new star of evangelization, John Paul II. Mm -hmm. That's Our Lady of Guadalupe. But did you know that the Immaculate Conception, she's a patroness of the United States. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, she's a patroness of the United States. Any Filipinos here? No. No Philippines? <laughs> did you know there's a patroness of the Philippines? Did you know that? Yeah. yeah, you probably didn't know that. She's a patroness of various countries, mm -hmm. but patroness of the United States and the Philippines. Exactly. 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 And, as you just mentioned, of all the churches in all the churches in the, in the world, St. Peter's in, in Rome is the biggest church. But by far the most beautiful church in the United States, sorry to say it's not St. Peter Chanel. Oh. And the area it is, right? <laughs> but 
the Immaculate Conception, you ever been to Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yeah. It is beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? So, if you're ever in, ever in Washington, D.C., make sure you make a pilgrimage to the Immaculate Conception. It's, it's, it's majestic, it's beautiful. Beautiful chapel of Our Lady of Lupa there. So, that, that is, it's the capital of our country, and they have the most beautiful church in this country, the Immaculate Conception. Okay. A brief catechesis on what the Immaculate Conception is. The Immaculate Conception um, was defined by Pope Pius IX in 1854. And it's defined dogmatically that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. That's what it means. So we came into the world with original sin. But Mary, the word, the word that the theologians use is preserved. For God intervened, mean, and God preserved Mary from the stain of words in the sin. Preservation. So that's what can be celebrated on, on Friday. Yes. And uh, that's uh, a great solemnity. Now in the Mass, you notice some differences. We're not praying the Gloria. No, we're not, no, we don't pray the Gloria on, on Sunday, but in that conception, we will be singing the Gloria. We will have the creed. We will have the prayer of the faithful. It's the solemnity, it's the highest character in the liturgical year having the solemnity. So that's what we'll be celebrating in a couple of days, Thursday. The Mary Feast Day, December 12th, is? Maybe a brother. Our Lady of Guadalupe. On a, on a parish level, well, the parish is going to be celebrating Our Lady of Guadalupe on the 12th, but also on Sunday, we're going to be having a procession from City Hall to the church uh, at 9 o'clock. So we invite all of you to come. They're going to have the four apparitions, the four floats, of the four apparitions of the Lady of Juan Diego. Mm -hmm. So I invite you all to come. Okay? To put that in your calendar. So this coming Sunday, meet at City Hall mm -hmm. at 9 o'clock, we'll leave about 9.15. Mm -hmm. We'll be walking about 40 minutes. We'll be with songs and chants and the rosary. And it's uh, we're making a public profession of our Catholic faith. Amen. And John Paul II insisted and we as Catholics having public professions, mm -hmm. manifestations of our Catholic faith. So I invite you to set that morning apart and to honor Our Lady Guadalupe and to be part of our parish. Okay? We want you to come and bring your children, bring your grandchildren. And talk about catechesis. That's, that's a great catechesis for children. You see. Song and the image of Our Lady Guadalupe and the incense and the priest walking. It's just a beautiful moment of grace, so take advantage of that. Okay, take advantage of that. Amen? Amen. 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 Don't sleep in. Okay? <laughs> and then there'll be a fiesta of food. That's right. Good. But before that, Barbara's the mass. <laughs> Good luck to us, okay? So we arrive. There's going to be the Mata China, if you remember, in Spanish. So Mexican dancers, dancing the water with a little looping. We'll have the mass, and then we will have the food. As they say in Spanish, pasar de la mística a la mastica. I had to change that, that baby, huh? It sounds better than Spanish, doesn't it? Pasar de la mística a la mastica. <laughs> Another important saint in Advent is Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas. Okay, Saint Nicholas. Church. <laughs> We're just talking about Saint Lucy. Well, that was my homily in Spanish. You understood it, but also Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph is very important. And he's so humble and inconspicuous. He can almost pass him by. Saint Joseph is the greatest saint. So. Oh, St. Joseph, pray to St. Joseph, have a statue of St. Joseph, honor St. Joseph. 
Thanks to Father Calloway for the beautiful consecration tonight. I did a couple of times. Father Craig did about five times. So if you go to that camp to renew your devotion to St. Joseph, he's a great saint, right? Amen. Another important saint, and I worked on a, an article this afternoon, is St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist is prominent in Advent, especially in the St. John the Baptist. And when you're reading, you're doing your meditation on Luke chapter 1, he's going to be a prominent figure there, okay. St. John the Baptist. Okay, what is the danger in Advent and Christmas? Okay, there's a lot, but I'll just throw one out. And as soon as I say it, you're going to say, that's the best word, Father, is materialism. Uh, commercialism is a part of materialism, consumer. But materialism is the overall umbrella. Having, having lived in other countries, where you go, like if you go to one of those islands in the Philippines and you barely have enough to eat, yes. having lived in, in Chile uh, with, uh, with abject poverty in Argentina, come here in the United States, you're going to have everything. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever had, you've ever lived outside of the country, some of you are born in the Philippines, some of you are born in Mexico, mm -hmm. other countries. Here we've got so much. So the danger is we can be blinded by materialism and sensuality mm -hmm. and hedonism. And even gluttony. So many, so many guesses and parties. So let's uh, make sure that uh, we're not blinded by materialism. Don't put the social above the sacrament. Don't put the material above the spirit. Don't put the temporal above the eternal. Don't put the palpable over the mystical. Some of those contrasts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. <laughs> so let's move on. Okay. Now, uh, as mentioned earlier, as mentioned earlier, I would suggest that in your homes, if you have an Advent wreath, Spanish Corona de Viento, do you have one already? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. yes. not go to 99 cents tonight, okay? <laughs> or maybe Nordstrom would have them. But you should all have one of those. And that was because when you see that, that makes you think of the fact we're in a different season. You communicate by means of symbols. And I would say also have your manger. Have your, your manger scene and have the Advent wreath. Have that. Now where are you going to put it? Not in the attic or the garage, okay? <laughs> in the back of the car. Have it in a prominent place. I would say in your, in your dining room. Every time you come in to eat as a family, you see that. And I would say, talk to your children, or your, your grandchildren, about what that is, what it means. Okay, so there we have it. Let's, uh, let's give a very simple interpretation of it. So let's start with colors. Start with colors. Okay, green is a color that symbolizes hope. Okay? Not money. <laughs> Not money, yeah. <laughs> Green is a color that symbolizes hope. I think what John Paul, John Paul II has said, of all the virtues that are weak today, is the virtue of hope. And I, I would agree with that. What do you think? I mean, people have faith. Yeah. Maybe they're trying to practice you know, corporal works. I think a, a lot of people, the opposite of hope, are giving you the despair. Yes. That's why a lot of people take medications. Yeah, I, I think we're, li we're living in a world where, where the virtue of hope is very weak. Mm -hmm. Very weak. So let, 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 let's pray that we would be people of hope. And what hope is really related to, my friends, is very much related to 
the divine mercy devotion. You hear me? Yes, Father. I, 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 I honestly can't, I can't imagine anyone reading and meditating the diary of St. Faustina. Honestly, reading it, meditating it, maybe one number a night. Uh, I think it's an almost infallible remedy against hopelessness. And being a student of English literature, I've never believed to open up the book at random. I never liked it. But that book, I don't, no matter where you open it up, whatever num number your eye flows upon, it's going to speak to you. So I'll give you one of my favorite numbers, number two. He says, Jesus says to St. Faustina, don't worry about the past. Now we worry, don't we? Yeah. Don't worry about the past. Leave that in the infinite ocean of God's mercy. A lot of us are living in the past. Then he says, don't worry about the future. Because we don't have the future. And a lot of us are still living in the past. We are. We can't be. We're living in the past and we're worried about the future. We don't live the sacrament of the present moment. That is the secret of St. Therese of Lisieux. The secret of the little flower in front of her, you should have, right? Yes. Is that she would insist upon living the sacrament of the present moment. The past, God's infinite ocean of mercy. The future, trust in divine providence, live in the present moment. That's number two. But she adds one thing. I walk through life like a little baby in the arms of the mother. I love it. How many mothers here? You know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. Remember you had your little child in your arms, and maybe he's fearful, mm -hmm. and then you pick him up and you put him close to your heart, and then he falls asleep over your arm, right? Mm -hmm. That's all of you. We have to be like that little baby falling asleep over the heart of the mother. That's what basically what Faustina is saying. So we are people of hope. For people of hope. The greatest work written by John Paul II was written by George Weigel, and the name of that book is Witness of Hope, more than a thousand pages. Have any of you read it? Yes. Yeah, just if you're aware of it yourself, that's the, that's the best biography of John Paul II written. It goes up to the year 2000. George Weigel is still an American Catholic journalist. He was celebrating the 25th anniversary. He went to see the Pope and the Pope said, I want you to write my love. And that's how it came about. He had many interviews and put together a spiritual classic. And he's called The Witness of Hope. Hmm. I'm told the second. The Witness to Hope. You know, he once, he, you know, he once visited Harlem, New York, John Paul II. Mm -hmm. Harlem, you've heard of Harlem, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tough neighbor. And he was going through that, and he was saying, but, but there is a resurrection. It was there Easter. There is a resurrection. So we believe in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. We are people of hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So, green is the color of hope. The circle. The circle points to one of God's attributes. Circle, no beginning, no end. That points to the fact that God is infinite and God is eternal. God has no limits, he has no beginning, and he has no end. Whereas we, we had a beginning, but we have no end. Right? Where were all of you 95 years ago? None of us existed. Only God's mind. But once we come into existence, we will be living forever. Living forever. And dying God's grace. St. Alphonsus says the grace of all graces is to die in the state of grace. Amen? Amen. So the grace of all graces is to die in the state of grace. So we want to enter into that eternal circle of God's presence by living in His grace 
dying in his grace, and then be united with him for all eternity. The next would be in the candles. And maybe this is obvious to you, but when we celebrate birthdays, what do we have? Candles. Well, a candle points to the fact we're celebrating a birthday, right? All right? There's a big difference between a candle that is lighted and a candle that's blown out, right? There's a big difference, right? Yeah. Yes. So the candle points to one of the attributes of Christ. In which he said in the Gospel of St. John, I am the light of the world. So that's one of the attributes of Christ. I am the light of the world. Remember when we went to the Sermon on the Mount about two months ago? Sermon on Jesus also says, you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. He's the light of the world in capital letters. We are the light of the world in small letters. So in this season of Advent, you're called to be a light to the world. The Christopher movement says, better, better, to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Mm -hmm. Better to light the candle than to curse the darkness. It's easy to curse the darkness, but the darkness is going to become even more dark. Mm -hmm. But even though you light, you light a small candle, I love the Mass, which is the Easter Vigil Mass. Have you ever gone to that? Yes, oh, yeah. Easter Vigil Mass is in darkness and all those people are coming in with that little candle. Come in little candles. And by the time they're in, you got 750 people with little candles. But, but they got the candle from where? From the Paschal candle. And the Paschal candle is Christ, the light of the world. Amen? Amen. Okay? So candle. Number of candles would be? Four. 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 And the four? four you, that's right, Father. You're always, you're always going to have four Sundays, okay? Even the shortest Advent, you're always going to have four Sundays. Okay, so the four candles. And then we have the colors of the candles. We, we, we already mentioned the color purple. Okay, purple is a color that symbolizes penance. Thank you, Patrick. Penance and conversion. Okay? So it's symbolic of penance and conversion. Okay, here's, here's the hundred dollar question. Are you ready? This will help you do your meditation. Are you ready? Yes, Father. What is your biggest obstacle? What is your biggest obstacle for your willing to fall totally in love with the baby Jesus in the arms of heaven? Each and every one of us, we have to bring that to prayer. What is your biggest obstacle? Okay? Now, don't say it publicly, okay? <laughs> now bring that to prayer tomorrow. I have, uh, I personally know, I know, I, I, know, my, I, know, my, I know my two basic uh, kryptonites. I know them. They're right in my, right my face. And I'm working on them now, okay? Very clear. God to ask me. I know very well two things I gotta work on. And I bring that to the Lord in prayer and confession and, and I think you've got your you have your own kryptonites too, right? Yes, Father. I'm not alone, I think. Nope. As we see something. So what what would be your major what is, what is your major roadblock, obstacle, barrier that's preventing you from arriving in Christ? Well it's painful. But in your Meditation on Luke chapter 1. Beg the Holy Spirit to show you what is that major roadblock that's preventing you from, be, from becoming a great saint. We all have that. And if we don't come to terms with that, we're, we're, we're going to be stagnating. We're not going to be growing. So, in all humility and trust, beg the Lord to, to show you what the thing you have to work on so that the grace of God can flow much more much more freely. Okay? Amen? <coughs> and I know it's a tough question. It's a tough question for me, too. But how are we going to be converted if we don't recognize what we have to work on? Amen? Amen. Okay. So that's the purple. 
Now, why do we have um, why do we have the the uh, the pink, pink color? Or what, when when will we light that candle? Because the third Sunday of Advent, we write that we light that candle, and that is symbolic of joy. Okay, pink symbolizes joy. Okay, we got we, we got mothers here. Okay, do you remember when you were about to have your first child? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. I, I think you probably had mixed emotions. One would be a boy. Yeah, they're pretty painful. Huh? Yeah. And they come up sideways, front or back, or uh, I think there'd be that there'd, there'd be that fear, I imagine. Right? Yes. But I think your your joy of knowing you have a child went beyond your fears. Mm -hmm. Is that true, Rosa? I would say yes. I mean, look at it. It's going to be painful. Yeah. But you know, you know, after the pain, Jesus even says, after a woman brings forth the child, she repents the pain because the baby's born. You see your little child smiling at you you're the first time. Wow, forget about that thing, huh? Yeah. So Mary was joyful because she was about to bring into the world the same in the world. Can you imagine the joy of Mary? So that's the reason behind that joy, because Jesus is about to be born, and he's going to be born to save us and to bring us to heaven. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, colors... Then the, there's actually a fifth candle, right? The fifth candle is it's in the very middle, and we put it there Christmas Eve, and that color is white. Okay, we got a big white candle that's placed in the middle of the Advent wreath, and that's symbolic of the fact that Jesus is born. So. We'll leave it at that. Uh, let's say a, a, a hell bearer for everyone. Uh, there is the apple, but, but there's sometimes you have an apple to read, which is symbolic of the sin of Adam and Eve, and Jesus came oh. to overcome original sin, the happy fault that sin does in speaks about. Oh. Jesus, as a result of his incarnation, he was able to bring his life, life in abundance. So let's say Hail Mary, and then we'll divide it into groups. And then uh, your, your meditation will be Luke chapter 1. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women. 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 Blessed are as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end.